Today's video comes from an interview I conducted in early 2017 with Father Michael Alexa when he came to the area to give some lectures. Father Michael is a talented storyteller. He has served as a village priest, as a university professor, and has written a number of books on Alaskan culture and history. So I hope you'll enjoy this episode uh, from my interview with Father Michael. The experience of the church in Alaska is somewhat unique, at least in North America. Uh, I think what Native Alaskans bring to the church and what it, they might be able to offer all Orthodox Christians is a sense that Orthodoxy is more than a religion that you practice on Sundays and holidays. It's a way of life. And for them, it, it became a way of life because the early missionaries, in a sense, took their time to um, understand the indigenous culture and their spirituality, and then introduced orthodoxy as the fulfillment of what the people already knew. And in this case, their basic spirituality was rooted very much in the ecosystem in which the people lived. There was a sense that tribal peoples, not just the, tw not just the 12 tribes of, of Israel, but all tribal peoples believe they live in the Holy Land. <laughs> that the land in which they uh, have been born is the land God has given them. And they therefore are in, in, entrusted with this land to take care of it, not just for themselves and to reap its benefits and its resources, but to prepare and to sustain that ecosystem for future generations. And so Alaska Native people in particular have been between seven and 10,000 years living in the same place, rooted in that land, and I would say loving that land and treating it as a sacred heritage and of course using its resources but using the resources in a, in a careful uh, uh, in a way of stewardship so that it can be preserved and enhanced for their children their children's children and as native people say unto the seventh generation so you have people who depend completely on that ecosystem for their livelihood for their sustenance there's no grocery store to go to you have to harvest meat and fish and berries and and plants uh, from that from within 50 miles of your home and very seldom do people venture beyond that you stay within 50 miles of radius of your home the, your whole life but you come to know every bend in the river and every rock on the hill uh, quite intimately you know the, that territory like the back of your hand as they say and then you love it and you treat that land with a kind of reverence and the animals that live there, you know their, their habits, you know where they live, you know how they um, build their homes and, and where they sleep in the winter and where they bear their, their young and the fish, where the, what, what time of year they migrate up the stream. And your, your life is attuned to those natural rhythms of the natural environment uh, that surround you. And then the, their own stories taught them to treat all of that as a gift. Uh, a hunter might be smart and strong and have the right equipment, but unless the animals come close enough, you never even see them. Consequently, they believe that every successful hunt is the gift of the animal and its self-sacrifice. It's sacrifice for the welfare and the well-being and the sustenance of the human beings. The human beings are actually kind of a, a ridiculous and helpless animal living in that landscape. The wild animals can live there without housing and without heat and without a lot of things that human beings obviously require just to survive. And so the animals actually kind of feel sorry for the humans <laughs> and offer themselves, give themselves in order to keep the human beings alive. The human response to that is an attitude of, of, of humility, respect, and, and, and appreciation of gratitude. And you show that gratitude by receiving the gift and then using it carefully, not wasting things. It's rather extraordinary how Alaska Native people, uh, when eating, will consume every little morsel of the meat from the bone of the animal because the bones are going to be returned to where they came from and you can't put them back with the meat still on it. That sends the message that the animal died, the resource was not appreciated, and discarded without being fully utilized. 
That's a kind of insult. <laughs> so th there's this, this care to use every part of the animal as is. Even the porcupine quills are used in, in the decoration of, of clothing and woven into it so that something as, we would say, useless as, as the quills of a porcupine can actually be put to use in jewelry and clothing. Uh, every part of the animal, the internal organs, uh, are, are used. The, the intestines make, made into raincoats. Uh, things that, even fish skins made into boots. <laughs> so that nothing is wasted because it was a gift and a gift have to, has to be used in a, in a, with an attitude of gratitude and respect. And of course we live in such a wasteful consumer society. It's one of the lessons that I think Alaskan natives would love to pass on to their friends and relatives in, in the first world, in the developed world. Not to be so careless and wasteful of food. They say that a good portion, up to 40% of the food in the United States is thrown away. Mm -hmm. The world is starving and we're, and our, we allow our children to turn up their noses and say, I don't like this. Okay, honey, we'll just give you, you know, a substitute menu tonight. Uh, from an Alaska Native point of view, it's like sacrilege. Why would you kill something, allow it to die to sustain you, and then in the end just throw it out? Uh, so especially meat products. <laughs> um, it's one of the. It's just a cultural attitude, but I think it's a. It's a Christian attitude, to re, to to see the world eucharistically. I would say, and not just in church, but in the way you live, uh, and to be careful with the resources and not be not squander them or treat them as if well, there's more where that came from, because of course we're reaching a point on the planet where there isn't more. <laughs> we're going to exhaust. Of the resources and then what. But in any case, Native Alaskans see this as a spiritual, not an economic question. The fact that, another important thing, we, we treat the water the same way, and of course the church has this wonderful tradition of going forth to bless the water. We do it officially like at, at Theophany in January, which in Alaska is probably the least comfortable time to have to bless water. Our water is pretty solid in January. But to go out on the river to cut a cruciform hole in the ice and invoke God's blessing on that lake or river is something really... They were doing it before they became Christian. At the same time of year, they also went out on the ice and they put um, parts of the animals that had been harvested during the previous year, particularly the internal organs. They, took, they saved them through the year and they put them through the ice precisely in December or January as an act of gratitude, or almost recycling, like planting seed. You put the, this part of the animal back where it came from, into the river, into the water, and in a sense invoke its spirit that it will somehow come back and, and replenish and refeed and offer itself again. This was being done before they became Christian. So when they saw the priests for the first time going out on the river, cutting a hole in the ice and putting the cross in, oh, it's just like what we do. Uh, we've been doing this for centuries. There's these parallels, but of course the great blessing of water is more than just recycling. It's invoking God's presence on the water, and by, by extension, all living things, because we're all basically made of water. The human body is more than 80% water, so in fact we're, a bunch, we're all a bunch of water walking around, with some kind of consciousness, but we're all mostly water. To invoke God's blessing on the water is to invoke God's blessing on life itself. And and the ecosystem that is fed by those waters. So, I think we should do it more often. Maybe, you know, I've always in my parish decided sometime in the summer, let's go do another blessing of water while it's, while it's warm enough to, for people to jump into it, rather than crack through the ice. I understand in Russia and, and in Finland, and some places in Siberia, people actually do, after the water's been blessed, they do jump into the newly sanctified water. Uh, Alaskans, I think, would be a little more, well, sensible, but um, they think hypothermia will kill you and it's no point in getting wet in the cold weather. But in, we go into a lake or, or riverside to bless the water more than once a year. I think it's something that Alaska more, more or less challenges uh, our suburban and very comfortable friends in the, uh, in the contiguous 48 states. It might be January and it's cold. Get out there and do it anyway. If we can do it in Alaska at 20 below, you can do it at 20 above. The, the cosmos needs, it's not so much that the cosmos needs, needs to be blessed, God blessed it when he created it, but we've lost consciousness of the inherent sacredness of the natural world. 
And I think this is one place where orthodoxy, the orthodox mission, uh, needs to, to take uh, a serious and public stance. I don't think there's any other Christian tradition that, that would do this, that would go out into the world and invoke God's blessing on the land and the water and such. For this very reason, people of my generation and younger are looking very often for a spirituality that will take into account their spiritual experience of nature. You know, the, the Sierra Club uh, environmentalist who hikes through the Sierras uh, or through the sequoia forests realizes that there's something deeply spiritual about this experience of human beings going out into the natural world and appreciating its beauty and they start looking for a spirituality that will confirm and affirm that experience and they tend not to find it anywhere in Christianity. They tend to go off into Eastern Asian religions like Hindu and Buddhist practices or Native American because they see those spiritual traditions as being uh, affirming the, this, this experience that they've had of the inherent sanctity of nature. We Orthodox are the one Christian tradition that can affirm and celebrate that, but we don't do it very well if we do the great blessing of water only inside the temple, you know, in the baptismal font or whatever, a special container, and never leave the building. I think it's part of our, our sacred mission, especially in this country, uh, and especially at Theophany, for every parish in every town um, to leave the church and go to the nearest lake, river, or reservoir and perform the great blessing of water. It should be something we're known for. Hi again. Hope you enjoyed this episode from my interview with Father Michael Alexa. Please subscribe to get notified when new videos become available, which happens every Friday. And if you would, please leave a comment below letting me know what you thought of this video. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week.